Good evening, everyone. Um, so we're going to talk briefly about the ways in which Christianization played a key role in the shaping of Irish identity and the cultural perception of Ireland and the Irish from the 5th to the 12th centuries. This is showing a satirical map of Ireland uh, from the 19th century, around the time of uh, whole uh, home rule. The life of Jesus of Nazareth was lived on the eastern margins of the Roman Empire in a remote corner of Palestine. Prior to his ascension on the Mount of Olives overlooking Jerusalem, Jesus promised his disciples that they would soon receive the power of the Holy Spirit and so be his witnesses even to the ends of the earth. At the end of Matthew's gospel, the risen Jesus commissions his disciples in Galilee to make disciples of all nations and baptize them, promising to be with them in their ministry, even to the end of the world. Some 400 years later, when the Roman Empire in the West was collapsing, the Evangelion, or good news about Jesus, the Savior, came to these shores in the person of a slave. The upper-class Romano Briton, Patricius, who we now know as St. Patrick, was captured by Irish pirates while a teenager growing up in Western Britain. He would have been well aware of Ireland's notorious reputation in the social imaginary of the late antique world. As a slave and shepherd working on the hills in the west of Ireland, he would have been in no doubt that he had indeed come to the ends of the earth. Ireland and the Irish were synonymous with barbarism and savagery in the Roman colonial imagination. It was a place where ethnographic fantasies and imagined geographies could be projected, a classical precursor to Joseph Conrad's Heart of Darkness. Patrick's near contemporary, the great biblical scholar, St. Jerome, claimed to have witnessed Irish acts of cannibalism as a young man. Around this time, a new word came to be applied to the Irish, scotus or scoti in the plural, which literally means shady character or knife's man, and likely comes from a language that was a precursor to Welsh. With no disrespect intended to our Scottish cousins, Scotland literally means the land of the dodgy people. <laughs> but it was, of course, a term first used for Ireland and the Irish. For Patrick, the slave who found God in Ireland, when he later returned here as a bishop, Ireland's remoteness and liminality had now paradoxically become central to salvation history. This is showing the uh, Hereford Mapamundi from the 13th century. <clears throat> and you see there in the bottom uh, left, highlighted in red, uh, Hibernia, Ireland, and Britain at the very margins of the medieval world with Jerusalem uh, in the center. By the preaching of the gospel in Ireland, Christ's mandate to his apostles had been fulfilled now that the gospel had indeed reached the ends of the earth. This heralded the parousia, or Christ's second coming, and the end time, giving a sense of urgency to this period. For those of us who study the literary, theological, and archaeological remains from early Irish uh, Christianity, we are constantly struck by the fervor, frenetic sense of urgency, and dynamism of these early Christians. For the colonial elites of the Roman world, the Irish had been considered less than human, beyond the pale in terms of Christianization, but through the ministry of missionaries like Patrick, they had now become incorporated into the universal body of Christ. The church that Patrick and his successors established in Ireland in the fifth century, during the waning years of the Roman Empire, grew into a dynamic and outward looking church in the 6th and 7th centuries. The great Irish monasteries, such as Bangor, Clonmacnoise, Glendalough, and Armagh, were established during this period, 
And now Irish Christians were venturing beyond the island's shores, bringing in their turn the gospel to faraway places and peoples. In 563, the Irish monk Columba, or Columcilla, founded the monastery of Iona in the Scottish Hebrides and became an apostle to the Picts of Northern Britain, modern day Scotland. Monks from Iona later played a key role in the conversion of Northern England and a great book of Columcilla, the ninth century book of Kells, now resides here in Trinity College, Dublin. And this is showing uh, St. Martin's Cross from Iona from the 8th century, uh, the temptation of Christ and the Book of Kells. And the cross on the right is um, the cross of St. Patrick and St. Columba uh, in Kells. Columba's near contemporary, Columbanus, uh, or Little, Little Dove, uh, left Bangor in Northern Ireland for France in 590 and established a number of monasteries in Eastern France and in Northern Italy that would have an unbroken history of more than a thousand years up to the French Revolution. These Irish monastic exiles were the first to express a sense of Irish identity in writing and were well aware of the negative classical perceptions of Ireland. However, they now understood themselves to be a chosen people and of playing an integral part in God's plan in salvation history, just as the English and the Franks also understood themselves to be chosen peoples as well through their conversion to Christianity. Irish exiles such as Columbanus and his later compatriots played a key role in shaping a new perception of Ireland and the Irish that would shape foreign perceptions of their island homeland. This can be seen, for example, in two authors writing in Southern Germany in the ninth century. The monk uh, Wallerfred, writing from the island monastery of Reichenau in the 830s, cites a third century Latin grammarian, Salinus, about the dangers of overgrazing cattle in Ireland and how no snakes and few birds were to be found on the island. The accounts of Salinas and others concerning the Irish, however, he dismisses because the Irish are now Christian. He cites the biblical phrase from St. Paul that where sin abounded, grace does more abound in defense of the Irish uh, moral reputation. The shocking accounts uh, refers to this work by Salinas around the ter ter turn of the third century, which characterizes Ireland as inhuman in the savage rituals of its inhabitants. On that island, there are no snakes, few birds, and an unfriendly and warlike people. And this perception of Ireland was transmitted via Isidore of Seville, writing in Spain in the seventh century, to the English monk Bede, writing in Northern England in the eighth century. And this is showing uh, a depiction of, a later depiction of St. Brendan uh, celebrating mass on, on the back of, the, of a whale. And this is around the time that the famous uh, voyage of St. Brendan or Navigatio Bren Brendani uh, is, is written. But back to Bede. Bede's take on Salinas in his opening chapter of his famous ecclesiastical history of the English people was very different. From a curio type wonder, he elaborated it into a theological narrative in which Ireland assumes the outline of a biblical promised land. Not only were no snakes to be found in the island, but if any merely smelt the Irish air, they would immediately die. He asserts that objects from Ireland were antidotes to poison and notes how the scrapings from Irish manuscripts when placed in drinking water could cure people of snake bite. He then states the island abounds in milk and honey. So in Bede's view, Ireland assumes a biblical dimension, the land of milk and honey of a promised land, and the passage a religious significance. Snakes, symbolic of evil, could not exist on holy soil. The monk and later bishop of Passau in southern Germany, uh, Ermenrich, shared the same view in the ninth century when he wrote an allegorical interpretation of Bede's passage uh, for the abbot of St. Gaul. And he cites Bede's passage in full, 
but he gives a, an allegorical commentary on it called A Mystical Interpretation of the Island of, of Ireland. So for Ermenric, the absence of snakes meant that neither the devil nor any pestilential person could have communion with the church. Ireland is a land of milk and honey is explained in terms that link it with the universal church. Indeed, Ireland is held up as a symbol for the unity of the church. The Irish monk uh, Dovdun, who's writing the Monastery of St. Gall uh, later in the 10th century, displays similar ideas in his poem about the holy men who left Ireland for the continent. Now, there were clearly some ethnic tensions in the Monastery of St. Gall between the Irish brothers and the native monks. Dovdun writes how the monks of St. Gall despised their Irish brethren as wretched imbeciles. And these ethnic fault lines may have led to a heightened sense of Irish identity amongst the Irish abroad, as seen in the case of Dovdun's poem. In contrast, he writes about the eminent saints who were buried at St. Gall, his compatriots, who he calls illustrious native men whom noble Ireland, our island, nourished. This territorial attachment is further underlined in an ethnic sense, as Dovdu notes that he and these saints come from the same stock, they're from the same people. The classical view of Ireland was of a strange and barbarous land, while during the early Middle Ages, this significantly altered due to the effects of Christianization, so that Ireland was seen as the insula sanctorum or the island of saints a perception that was largely shaped by the Irish monastic exiles themselves abroad. The final or third stage in this process is a return to the classical uh, perception. When the view of the Irish as barbarians was resurrected in the wake of ecclesiastical reform and the conquest of Ireland in the 12th century. Ireland's aura of sanctity and exoticism portrayed in earlier accounts was easily forgotten by the Anglo-Normans when, when confronted with the sober realities brought about by conquest from 1169 onwards, as Ireland was incorporated into what's known as the First English or Angevin Empire. And this is showing the uh, depiction of the native Irish uh, in a contemporary manuscript uh, um, that's now in, in Dublin showing uh, the kind of barbarous Irish in a coracle or curragh off the west of Ireland and this aspect of the, the, the violence of, of the Irish um, in Gerald of Wales' uh, account. So we see here how the perception switches back to what I call the original Wild West. Um, but for a few centuries before the waning and waxing of the Roman and Angevin empires, the incorporation of the Irish within the universal church provided the Irish with a means of belonging to a universal and inclusive mandate that made it a light to the nations of early medieval Europe. In our module on Christianity of the Celtic world, we explore this dynamic and theologically very rich period through studying the material remains from early Christian Ireland and a range of literary and theological texts from the time of Patrick in the fifth century up to the turn of the 11th century. I look forward to answering any questions you may have and hopefully to meet you in person in the autumn. Thank you.